Welcome to Remo Daily. We have, for the first time, a guest today who is a full-time stand-up comedian in New York City, Wally Collins. Welcome to Remo Daily. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's my round of applause for myself. Thank, thanks for having me. <laughs> Wally, I have checked into a few virtual comedy sessions, and I have a friend who works in, in comedy, and... All I, I got was incredibly hard. Is that what you experienced as well? Because everybody has to leave their mics on or not. Like this whole decision of how do you create an atmosphere in a room? How did you deal with that over the last two years? Oh, man. Um, first, it was um, loneliness and desperation. I, I, ne I needed to, to, you know, communicate to, with people, you know, and um I knew that, uh, you know, with Zoom or with the, you know, this kind of technology, that is probably the best and only at that time to communicate. Um, I had to keep in mind that, you know, with technology, there's going to be some hiccups and some adjusting, adjusting. So I wanted to entertain. I wanted to put that kind of like love, not to sound so cliche, out there. But um, I knew I had to learn. Uh, how to do that. So that was my motivator. I wanted to get out there and, and uh, entertain. So once uh, I got asked to do a, a, a Zoom comedy show, um, okay. I learned. I learned that there's a slight delay uh, with the, uh, you know, the audience um, who was watching. Um, I'm not going to hear, you know, a thunderous tsunami of laughter. I'm going to hear like little pops of like laughter or whatever. So I learned to look at people's faces. Um, you know, when I see teeth, I, I think it's, uh, you know, they're smiling or they're hungry, but I'm going to go with um, <laughs> they're happy. And so when I see that, that's kind of like a check, like, okay, that joke worked. So it is an adjustment, but in the, in the end, it's a great feeling because, you know, there are people who are stuck in their homes too, and they want, to, you know, to somehow communicate or connect to, you know, whatever. And, you know, somehow for, forget what's going on, you know, in the world. So I wanted to take on that so speak responsibility to, to help, you know, to help do that for what, how long am I not, I'm talking 10, 15, 20 minutes, whatever. Um, so yeah, so that was my motivate because I, I, we're all in the same boat. Just trying to imagine when a joke doesn't work and you look around the zoom room and you're like, is this a delay or is it just no laughter at all? Is is that did that happen or? Yeah, of course that happens. So, but you, you know, you 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 make a joke about like an it. Endless you know, delay. Like, apparently, you know that joke did not work. It's the technology actually in the real world. You know, people will pass out from laughter. So I'm going to blame that on technology and sound delay. But yeah, you, you, you kind of like just you know um, state the obvious or acknowledge the obvious, and you know, and then you just move on. And I just I was my own technology just stopped working. So here yeah, so here they, we go. Um, and my, I have to had to switch my cameras. It's it, this is, yeah, this is an in, in, intense for me to imagine. Did you get hackled over Zoom as well? Did that happen? Well, you know, it's it's a different kind of heckling. Um, you know, when we consider heckling, it's like someone interrupting, you know, your shows, interrupting your set. So um, if you want to, <laughs> you call heckling people opening up a bag of chips while you're uh, watching the show, <laughs> or so that. yeah, yeah, or you know, someone's dogs barking or someone yelling to their husband or wife, hey, I'm watching comedy. Come on, watch this. This is fun. You know, so, yeah, you're going to get that. But once again, you just acknowledge it, you know, and and, and say something about it because it's, it's in people's brains, too. And once you acknowledge the obvious, people are like, OK, you, you're connecting with them. And uh, it just makes it fun. Well, you have been uh, you have been in this industry for a long time. And I just wanted to help everyone understand, like, you're 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 you know, you're you're over you're over it like your your bag of work is so impressive when did you actually start doing stand-up when was that and 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 how did you get into it okay um so i was i went to college i studied uh, architectural technology in college and uh i got myself a job designing buildings and but i always wanted to perform uh, i'm a musician too i'm a drummer actually a jazz drummer and i oh, thought wow. i was gonna you know design buildings during the week on weekends uh play music but I really, really enjoyed, or I had this, I calling this, this connection with, uh, with acting. And so I was just having a conversation with my mother and, uh, she said, you could be anything you want to be. What would it be? And I said, I'd love to be an actor. And she says, why are you designing builders? If you want to 
be an actor. And I said, well, I come from a town called Springfield, Massachusetts. No one famous ever came from Springfield, Massachusetts. And she gave me three words. You never know. And that was my motivator. And I'm like, really? She's like, yeah, well, why not try it? And I said, well, you know, I don't even know where to start to actually want to try stand up comedy and then parlay that into like an acting career. And my, both my parents were just very, very supportive. And I thought that was kind of trippy. And they said, listen, we just want our children to be happy in what they're doing. You know, why, why would you want to go to a job at nine to five where you're miserable? You know, we don't want that. We just want you to be happy, be responsible, but be happy with what you're doing. So um, I got on stage. I, I did. I, I bombed. It was it was horrible. It, you know, it wasn't like that fan, you know, beautiful moment, whatever. It was horrible. But I got advice from the manager slash booker. And he said, you have the gift. And uh, you have to learn how to write jokes. It was just, just technical things, you know. Describe horrible. Like what, what happened? Okay. All right. Here we go. <laughs> so um, I looked at an ad in the paper and they're looking for performers, you know, comedians, musicians, da, da, da. So I called them. I said, listen, I want to try comedy. And the guy goes, yeah, sure. We have a lot of comedians. So come on, come on over, come on down, whatever. And uh, he says, prepare five minutes. Now, me being so arrogant, I prepared 10 minutes because I knew my stuff was so funny and I'm going to have an encore. So uh, I got there. I had a suit on, tie. I look good. I look good, my man. I look good. And um, I did my 10 minutes in three minutes. And I had no structure to my jokes. And I, I, oh, man. And you knew, you could tell that, or I could tell that I was bombing because I wasn't getting any laughter. The only thing I could hear was someone stirring the, the ice in their glass. I could hear the tinkling, 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 tinkling. That's how quiet it was <laughs> after like my, my big closing joke. Wow. Or yeah, sitting right, in exactly. Ball. That's what I said. Wow. So I, I was making a beeline to my car and the, that's when the manager slash Booker, he stopped. He said, where are you going? And I was like, oh man, I tried it. And he goes, no, you should stay and look at some of the other seasoned comedians, performers. He goes, but you have something. And um, that very first time I stepped on stage as a comedian, he put five dollars of money in. He says, I want you to come back as a regular. So every Wednesday I will go back there and try to work on my jokes and things like that. And then I um, I got a gig uh, emceeing comedy shows in my in the area of uh, Springfield, Massachusetts. And that helped me write, that helped me perform and all that. And then I start uh, started doing gigs out in Boston, Massachusetts, which is like 90 miles west I mean, east of uh, Springfield. And then I started doing stuff in New England. And that's how I started building, you know, a, um, Got it. A, 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 an act and, you know, and, and all that. But I did that because of my mother's three words. You never know. And that was my mantra. Everything I tried, you never know. You never know. So there you go. How would you how would you describe the, the kind of brand of comedy that you do today? Um, it's, I, it got branded. I got reviewed one time and uh, I love the review. He, he, he called it clean and clever. Um, I write uh, clean jokes. I try to be as clever as I possibly could be. Um, and that takes me a, a lot further. Uh, I can do a lot more shows, a lot more gigs, and my stuff can get placed in a lot more places. Well, we, I asked you in the prep call, why do you do this? And you said power. Would you mind sharing with our audience what you mean by that? Oh, uh, okay. <laughs> I was, for the longest time, someone asked me to do it because I love performing, you know, that whole cliche stuff. But I, I was getting interviewed about six, seven months ago. And it was like this epiphany. And I realized that it was power. I have so much power around that stage. And um, I really enjoy uh, making people laugh, making people feel good. And I realized that when I'm on that stage, I'm the tallest person in the room. I'm the brightest, biggest person in the room because of the lights on me. And I'm the loudest person in the room. So I have all this power. And with that power comes great responsibility. And um, I took the responsibility of saying, you know what, in that time that I'm on that stage, I'm going to take these people with me on this so-called journey of, you know, of my life and just making them feel good. So um, with that power, I, I just I just love that, that I have that power and that responsibility. And it just it's just a great feeling. Wow. Um, we ask you to uh, to bring a question uh, for, for everyone in the room with us here. And use your use your imagination, your power in that way. Is there what, what are you curious about? What would you like to know from us today? When was the last time you laughed so hard that you cried? Tears came out, out, out of your eyes and, and you felt it in your belly. 
the point that, you know, you almost got nervous that you're going to pass out because of something that was just so funny, something that brought you so much joy that it took you to a place that you got nervous <laughs> that you're like, oh, my goodness. But, um, yeah, when was the last time you laughed so hard that, that you cried that it hurt? <laughs> Fabulous. Fabulous. Um, so when was the last time, Liz, thank you so much, Liz producing today and just shared the question with you in the chat. When was the last time you laughed, you laughed so hard that it hurt? And uh, Deb actually kicked us off and says, you know, whatever, when I, whenever I go to Jimmy Kimmel, uh, he gets me um, there once a week at least. Uh, so, wow. Um, good, good, good job, Jimmy. And uh, Sarah was at the stand, um, I guess, in the stand up environment, uh, laughing, laughing hard. Jimmy Carr show uh, from Rashad. And Eleanor says, oh, man, it's been so long. <laughs> yeah. I actually um, I can relate with that because, yes, um, right. It's been it's been hard to really laugh. It's a it's a dark time we're in. So when you look at the answers here, Wally, what what stands out to you? Um it stands out to me when I ask that question, it's very, very important to find that something that makes you laugh, that funny, something that, I mean, you can go, go far, go far back when you're a kid, you know, that, you know, you, you heard someone fart, you know, in church or something like that. It's, it's, it's very, really important to get your brain there to a funny place because it, you know, releases endorphins and all that, but it puts you, puts you, just puts you in a different space and in a happy and more, more peaceful space. And uh, I just recommend it, you know, to everybody, you know, find that thing that just makes you laugh. And if it's been a while, just go back to the last time that you laughed. And once you start thinking about that, you're going to loosen up. You're going to find, start finding things a lot, a lot more funny, a lot, you know, you're going to loosen up and yeah. And it's going to be a uh, uh, life's going to be a lot more fun. And Anne is just did that sharing here in the chat that uh, she met elementary school friends and they talked about all the things they did they were not supposed to do. So going going back, that is that's amazing, Anne. Uh, thank you for sharing that. That's what that's right there, uh, mm -hmm. where you just sat, Wally, and and find that uh, find that spot in in your lives. Well, I have to say I really admired um, comedians during the pandemic in a world that felt very dark at times um, to find to find a joke there. And now, of course, um, you know, especially in my, in my home country, Germany, we're again in a situation in Europe where at a distance, it's maybe like from going from New York to Ohio, there's like a war that looks that looks like from from back in the days, like the images, the cruelty, the the death, the, the destruction. And it's so hard to not be fearful. And, and um, of course, now we have a, a, a lot of refugees all over Europe that are bringing and, and uh, they're traumatized and they're bringing that horror with them. And so many people are looking for just a light spot and just a, a light place, just a moment of getting out of the, this dark headspace. How do you, how do you deal with that? And I'm, of course, war is a different thing than a pandemic, but maybe the recipes or the strategies you've found over the last two years can apply to both. How do you deal with that when you when you know that your audience is in this really, really difficult place? It's choice. It's always choice. Everything you do is a choice. To get out of bed is a choice. To, you know, uh, have breakfast is a choice. What you see, what you take in, is your choice. Do you choose to find those dark things and just hang on those things? Or do you choose to look at those things and try to find hope, try to find optimism, or try to find some way that you can help uh, uh, whatever you can to uh, get get them out of the situation or f feel better about yourself that feels like you are you are trying to, um, to help the situation? Um, it's all choice. It, and that's basically everything in, in life and in, in what we do. It's how, how you choose and what you choose to see and what you choose to feel. So it's your choice. And w is there, are there jokes you, you wrote about the pandemic specifically? Of course. Yeah, definitely. Um, you know, you, you got to find the funny in everything. There's funny in everything. 
And um, I talked about the pandemic. Um, I, um, I caught COVID back in March 2020 when no one knew anything about it. Oh, wow. Yeah. And in fact, anything they knew about it was that you're going to die. That was it. And um, it's a true story. So I went to the clinic and uh, there was a long line of people. And uh, the doctor was looking at my chart and she was like, yep, you, you got COVID. And I said, am I going to die? And she said, this, this is what she said. Most people don't. Next. <laughs> it's like, what? And so, <laughs> wow. yeah, and that's the truth. And so um, that was the longest night of my life because I thought, you know, I was going to pass away in my sleep that because I didn't. Didn't know how, how you know it's gonna happen. So I made peace with everything in the house. You know, I was I was rubbing the wall. I was like, thank you, wall, for supporting the roof. You know, I was looking at a lamp. I said, thank you, lamp. And I, yeah, look at this. And I go, thank you, dry sticks. You know, for for balancing my background. And I looked at the floor. I said, thank you, floor, for catching me when I fall. You know, and and things like that. And so then I said, all right. So if I'm gonna pass away, I want them to find me in a position that you know that meant something. So this was the whole time around BLM, Black Lives Matter. And so I said, well, if I pass away, I want them to find me, you know, in a position that makes sense. So I thought I said I so I laid down, I put my head down and I, I, I thought I'm going to sleep like this. Well, I thought, all right, they're going to be like, oh, he's political. Yay. All right. He's he's making a difference. But then I said, you know, what? I'm a comedian. I don't, I don't want that. I want people to see, you know, what kind of life I had. So I said, OK, if I'm going to pass away, I want them to find me like this. <laughs> you see? And so then they go, oh, okay, he's a funny guy. But see, that's the whole point. You know, you can find funny, you know, you choose, you know, what, you know, what, what you see, you know what I mean? And um, the mask, you know, the whole mask and wearing masks. I like people wearing masks for one reason. There are a lot less ugly people, you know, things like that. You know, uh, um, wearing a mask remind you to brush your teeth. Sorry, too soon for some of you. Yes, I remember um, the day happened to me. It was uh, April 4th, 2020, 9.30 a.m. I had to go to the grocery store. I put the mask on. I ran down the stairs. I exhaled and a tear came out of my eye. We all went through those moments. Yes, and, that, and that's when I said to myself, I need to floss more. Right. So, so you do. So you, you, you find, you find, you know, once again, it's a choice. But you gotta, you, you, you can find. You it. gotta floss. You gotta floss. Yeah. Yes, the flossing. Yes, that's very important. Not a choice. Yeah. A well, choice. I, I'm. Uh, I, I love what you just shared, and it reminded me of a, a podcast that I listened to with Conan O'Brien, who said he, he always talking about his own death, and he wants to be found by a jogger. And I, and I think that the reason is that he, it's he, he's still. You were still performing when you thought about your last moment. You, mm -hmm. you wanted to be found as a performer. You wanted to. Right be the center of attention. It, it's not just like, oh, he's gone. No, he was found in this crazy pose and it's a headline and right. you get the last laugh. Yeah, exactly. Fascinating. Exactly. And I think that's the, for me, that's my point is, you know, last laugh, you know? And so, uh, yeah, it's, it's, very, it's very important. Laughter is very important. But you have been in this industry for, for a significant amount of time and you've seen trends and people come and go. What is happening right now? How do you look at how the comedy scene, especially in New York, has changed because of the pandemic? Can you please um, take us there and describe what's going on? Well, back in the day, um, a lot of the comedians, um, their jokes were like longer. Their setups were a lot longer, a um, lot more words. But now we live in a such a Im immediate uh, um, society. Um, it, it, the jokes now are a lot shorter. The setups and punchlines are a lot shorter. Like on social media is. Uh, uh, a lot of a lot of those websites you're seeing a lot of people doing uh, um, their comedy, whatever. It's really quick. It's really really, really fast. And um, so you, you you're seeing that kind of like uh, on stage too. That people's attention is you know it's, it's got to be just quicker. So your 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 stand up um, it's just got to be just a little bit quicker. Could like uh, TikToky ish. Yeah, TikToky ish. Um, but if you really think about it, any of the social medias that you're watching. You know, people, you know, they have other distracted, they're on their phones. They have other distractions with the kids, you know, traffic or whatever, whatever. They don't have time to watch, you know, it, it, like, you know, a setup, you know, this is the story, da 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 punchline. It's just like the setup and like these pops, setup, punchline, setup, punchline, setup, punchline. 
And um, so you're noticing that I'm noticing that I should say uh, in the comedy clubs that the setups are a little bit shorter and the punchlines come a little bit quicker. And um, I've done it too. I've, I've, uh, I realize that. So my setups and punchlines are, you know, are um, shorter. My setups are shorter. My punchlines are quicker. And it, what do you think about that? Because I mean, it, 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 it would be easy to say, ah, that sucks. But is there, is there, is there a positive effect to that? Um, yeah, I mean, you know, it's the way of the world, you know, it's, um, basically how people are, are thinking. So you can adapt and I'm adapting because when I started, I started with those longer setups, you know, and punchlines that came a little bit later. Um, and I still sneak those in, you know, um, once I know I have the audience's attention, um, I tend, I'll, I will throw in a longer setup with a, you know, with a payoff, a payoff or punchline a little bit later on. I mean, for me, I think that's great because that's, you know, keeping my brain, uh, my skill set, another skill set that I'm, I'm learning and uh, keeping me in the game. I have consumed a lot more comedy during the pandemic that I used to, and I, I'm, I assume I'm, I'm not the only one. How is the overall demand for, for your craft developing right now? Oh man, once, I don't want to say once, but when it happened, when things started loosening up, especially in New York City, when things started loosening up and, and uh, uh, establishments and businesses started to open. And I knew this was going to happen, too, because um, during the pandemic, I was doing comedy in Central Park and people were showing up. You know, we, we I remember doing it for the first week and people, you know, there's just, there's these comedians just, just yelling out stuff and people are looking like, what, what's why are they doing that? About probably a month later. People were getting there an hour before with their blankets and lunch, you know, and they're waiting for a show. People need, need to be entertained. People need to escape. When I saw that, I was like, you know what? As soon as things open up, business mm -hmm. open up, it's going to be a comedy boom. And I'm telling you, man, the there are comedy clubs opening up all over the country. Restaurants are having comedy nights. Uh, hotels are having comedy in their lobbies because it's comedy is easy to produce. And it's just it's easy to have people to sit down and listen to these stories and just um, and just enjoy it. So um, and I've been telling my comedian friends, yo, you're you know, you're going to be very, very busy. I'm booked all the way to, to February of 2023 now because Fantastic. comedy is. Yeah. Comedy is just, you know, that thing that people need. You know, it's just it's, it's so simple of a, of a, of a venue. But please remind us and help and also help people like me, Wally, who have now grown grown accustomed to going after those Netflix specials. There's a new one like every other day. Uh, it's become such an important outlet for comedy. It's well produced. You have brilliant sound. You're very close to the face of the comedian. Um, what is the actual? Please remind us why we should go and see comedy live. Oh man, it's a whole different experience totally different experience when you're watching it on TV and watching it live because now you're in real time. You're actually watching comedian communicate with the audience and something may happen. Um, you know, someone may ask a question. There may be a heckler um, and you're in it for real. It's, it's just this feeling of like this uh, 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 camaraderie. Everyone's enjoying it. That feeling of connect. We're, we're social, we're social beings. We have to be, amongst our own, you know what I mean? And if there's a common uh, a ground or a common uh, a, a motivator and if it's stand-up comedy and what you and you can relate to, just think about that. You're in a room full of 100, 200, 1,000 people and you're all lapping collectively. That's just such a great feeling. It's a different feeling when you're on your couch with your remote control and listen to this guy or, you know, this comedian doing a knock-knock joke. You're like, ha-ha! Yes. And I, 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 just, I can't just quote Anne in the chat here who said, well, thanks for being here for us and well, um, making us laugh and, and making us choose to see the funny and, and the light. Um, that, that's great. Is there, a, you have, a, a, you're booked. So fantastic. I mean, kudos and congratulations on being busy. Um, it, however, I still wonder, like in your work, in your industry, what, what, like, is there a point where you can say, ah, I've, I've made it? Or is, or is there, I think uh, uh, John Stewart just, just um, 
uh, was awarded with a prize, and there's all, already peaking people now talking bad about, oh, where's Jon Stewart now? Um, who, and he said, there isn't any point in comedy where you make it or you don't make it. Would you would you agree with that? Or is there is there maybe today a standard by which you can say, I've made it? I tell my students, they ask me that question. I tell my students, once, once you decide that you want to be, to do something, whatever you want to be, and I, I'm talking about stand-up comedy, once you decide it, that you want to be a comedian and you step on that stage and tell your first joke, you made it. Because you went for your goal, you went for your dream, and you're doing it. Now, what it is, is like just, you know, just finding different things. You know, you want to work, you know, in a certain club, you want to work in a certain state, you want to work in a certain country, uh, your audience, you want to work, uh, do corporate, you want to work cruises, you want to work in colleges, um, you know. Or in hotel lobbies. Hotel lobbies. That was my dream. You know what I mean? So, um, yeah, there's there's ways that you can challenge yourself and saying, you know what, I'm gonna, I hit that plateau. Great. But now there's something else I want to do. Something, and it doesn't necessarily have to be performing. You could be writing. You know, I want to write a film. I want to write a sitcom. I want to write a book. There's so many way, ways I want to act. You know, there's so many way, ways and things you can do that, you know, if it's if I'm only talking about stand up comedy because what I know is that when you can start at that base and just it just it's it, it's endless. It's endless. We happen to have a uh, comedy student uh, here in the room with us, and I would just uh, like to ask uh, Sarah to join us on stage because she's not only a comedy student, she's also an amazing writer. She's the newsletter of Czar at Remote Daily, and we're very, very happy to have her on the team. So, um, Sarah, please join us for a very, very quick um, stand-up comedy workshop. And hi, and welcome to the Remote Daily stage. Good to have you. Hi. Um, hi, Wally. You have such amazing energy. Thank you for being here. Um, welcome. It's the espresso, but keep, keep, I'm listening. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that's what I need to try out too then. Um, so... One thing like while, you know, trying to do stand up is like one thing that I find really hard is getting used to bombing. How did you how did you get comfortable with, you know, jokes not landing or kind of going through that whole iterative process of, you know, trying jokes out on stage and then figuring out how to fix the delivery later on? Because it's it's really hard. Like people think, you know, oh, I'm gonna, I can do that. I could go up on stage and do that. But it's, it's super hard. Right. I mean, anything you do for the first time, it's hard. You know what I mean? You know, crocheting, it's hard. <laughs> um, but it's. But it's when you crochet, there's nobody in the back just clinking with their eyes. You know, <laughs> that's the difference. Well, yeah. you, ever see, you ever see me crochet? <laughs> 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 but um, yeah, it, it's one of those things. You, are you saying bonding with the audience or bonding? I'm not sure if I'm, I'm understanding the question. So, um, bonding with the audience is definitely part of it, but. Like when you say a joke, like you do the stand up, uh, like you, you do the setup and then you do the punchline and there's no laughter. It's like, how do you move on from that? How do you get used to that whole process of like getting getting through the whole set after that point? Oh, OK. So there's a couple couple of things with that. Well, first of all, if a joke doesn't land, um, you you should act like you meant that. Like it's no big deal. If you panic on that stage, the audience is going to panic too. They're like, oh no, she doesn't know what she's doing. And then everything just falls apart right after that. But people, when you get on that stage, people are looking for you, looking to you for them to take them away. You know, you're, you are the captain and you're at the helm of this, you know, time you're on stage. So they're giving all the trust to you. So take that trust, take that power, like I talked about before, and just understand that, you know, if a joke doesn't work, sometimes it doesn't. You just move on to your next one. And, um, you know, hopefully the next joke will get a laugh. Now, if you're getting a string of not laughs, maybe comedies you should be working. <laughs> you, could, you could try working in a diner or as a chef. But, um, but yeah, it, that's one way. One thing, we're, way to work at it is, um, you know, if a joke doesn't land, um, you just move on to your next one. Now, another thing, if a joke's not working, is the, the subject matter. Are you writing about something that you're passionate about? Are you writing about something that you absolutely love or something that you absolutely hate? That's where I tell my students where you start. Which is if they have like a, 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 a block, a, you know, a writer's block, whatever. 
are you passionate about that joke or passionate about that subject matter or that premise? That's very, very important. So go back and think about that bit that you wrote and see if you really are passionate about, you know, whatever you're talking about. And lastly, um, I tell my students, I'll give you some free advice too, is that whatever you're writing, every joke that you write should be your closing joke, should, should be your big closer. The reason why I'm saying that is that uh, a lot of comedians, when they start out, you know, they have that one joke that gets the biggest laugh and they usually save it for last. That's a big mistake because what happens is say you, you, you're slotted to do five minutes on stage and some reason, uh, you know, uh, Chris Rock, Chris, Chris Rock walks in or Jim Gaffigan walks in and wants, wants to go on stage. They'll cut your time. They'll give you the light. They'll give you the signal. So now you got to shorten your set. So now you got to stumble to your to your closer or, or whatever. So now you're going to stumble, blah, 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 blah. You know, you're trying to figure out how to how does that work? Blah, blah, blah. Did you get this one joke? And then you say your punchline. Someone sneezes. Uh, 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 someone from the waitstaff drops a drink. Someone coughs. Someone clears their throat. Now your punchline is eaten up. You got nothing now. So now you're like, oh boy. And then, yeah, it's a disaster. But if you write every joke in the mind of, as a closing joke, your big closer, you have nothing to worry about. If that closing joke didn't work, you got another one. Your problem should be when you're on stage or when you, before you go on stage, I don't know which joke I should close with because all of them are that good. That's some great advice. Um, yeah, it's like they say, like, you know, no one remembers the end of the Gettysburg Address. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, he actually said, I'm here all week, but. <laughs> Sarah, any joke you're working on right now? Oh, um, I I have a bunch that I'm working on. Uh, so I'm taking a class with like Karen Burgreen and uh, Andy. So, yes, um, they're amazing. Um, right. So she said to start from a place of like you have to find your own comedic style. So it's start from a place of what you think is funny. And yeah. so I found this. Um, I don't know. I was going through the Internet um, as one does. And I found this fact that I just found really funny um so apparently osama bin laden has the largest collection of tom and jerry episodes ever released like more than hbo max any other u.s streaming service like he has 121 tom and jerry episodes that have been released on the cia archives now and hbo max is like what 77 um and like all of the things that have been released um, from his archives, it's just like he has Mr. Bean on there and like Sean the Sheep, um, all these weird, um, it's it just, I find it absurd and funny just thinking of him like sitting and watching Tom and Jerry as like the US military breaks down um, his door. <laughs> so I'm still trying to figure out the setup and the uh, punchline structure of it, but I just thought that was something funny to run with. In the oh, that's great. That's, that's a great premise. I mean, you know, let your brain go. You know, I tell my students also think about go as, go as ridiculous or extreme or um, as crazy as you can with your punchline. You know, he can, he can start his, you know, he can zone his own channel, you know, uh, Tom and, you know, he likes Tom and Jerry after, you know, after a good bombing, you know, he'll watch some cartoons, something like that, but it's gotta be extreme. Just, just let your brain just go. Don't limit yourself. Don't say, oh, that's stupid. That's silly. Don't do that to yourself. Just go. Just go. You go. And you'll and you'll start to giggle. You'll giggle. And you'll you'll get a little chuckle within yourself. There you go. You got it. And Wally, may I ask, you know, now coming from this spot of you teaching others, and thank you so much, Sarah, for 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 jumping in here and um, really admire that you do that and you were even even sharing what you're working on. Thank you, and thanks for being a part of the Remote Daily team. It's really an honor to work with you. Hopefully, more uh, more jokes to be seen soon in the Remote Daily newsletter. Everyone, uh, no pressure. Uh, but Wally, wh who do you who do you look up to? Like, uh, do you have still have teachers? Do you have comedians that inspire you that you go to every day or every now and then? Man, let me tell you. Um, <clears throat> now I realize that you know, funny is from everybody, and so I'll go to a comedy club, and I may not know who that person is, but if they're funny, that's my motivator. Um, when I started out. Um, I loved a, a comedian named Franklin Ajay, A-J-A-Y-E, if you want to Google him. 
Uh, I loved his style. He had a nice, just a nice pace. He was just so smooth with it. And um, I finally met him um, about 10 years ago. And the highest compliment is when, you know, your, uh, your crush, I guess, repeats one of your jokes. And that's what he did. He repeated one of my jokes. So that was just a big honor. But um, yeah, I don't really have, I really don't have like that go-to comedian. I mean, I love comedy that much that my go-to is that person who's killing it right now at that moment on that stage. And you were just hired as a curator for Lincoln Center New Comedy Division. So congratulations on that. What are you going to do there? What's what are you what are you thinking about programming first? Well, we're, what we're doing right now, it's still new. And, you know, uh, Lincoln Center is Lincoln Center, the Lincoln Center, you know, ballets, opera, and they want to do comedy. So I'm getting, you know, a lot of furrow brows like mm, we don't know. So uh -huh. um, they're starting out really small, really, really small, which I can understand. Um, I produced two shows. I, I produced shows there already called Jokes and Jazz. And it was uh, comedy and jazz music. And uh, both shows sold out. And that's, I think, the reason why they came to me and say, listen, you know, we're thinking about doing this, this comedy thing. But here is another thing. This came after the pandemic. I'm telling you, you know, even Lincoln Center is saying, listen, we, you know what? We want to do comedy. So um, I'm going to do uh, the traditional, what we call a showcase uh, comedy style, where there's an MC and uh, five or six comedians doing um, sh like uh, 10, 10, 15 minute sets. And um, the powers that be are going to come, you know, check it out. And, I, you know, we're going to book comedians, uh, you know, the, like a higher end, a higher brow comedy, stuff that's more cerebral, stuff that's more thinkable, so to speak. Nothing. You know, nothing that low hanging fruit kind of stuff, stuff mm. that, that made people go, oh, wow, I, I didn't think of it that way. So I think Deb, that's really important. We just had the Upper West Side chiming in in the chat here. Deb says Lincoln Center doing comedy could be a set in itself. Yes. Um, so we'll see. We'll see what you're coming up there. Uh, fascinating. And John uh, J. Stu is suggesting maybe a comedy op opera. Would that be something for Lincoln Center to think um, about ripping give, off of jazz? We got, we got to get this up. We're doing a series, going to be eight series, and the first one's going to be June, uh, June fifteenth, every Wednesday, uh, June fifteenth, and um, so you come down, and uh, it's going to be in the J at, uh, Jaffe Drive. It's, it's like just under the uh, the actually building a comedy room um, with tables and chairs, and it's going to have like that. It's going to be a real funky comedy setting, and um, just very conducive for for comedy and uh, performers. Um, uh, a spoken word, poetry, and things like that. So, I would love to uh, end today with your book. Uh, you never know. Oh. Um, and it is a book of encouragements, which was actually self-published by you and then reissued during the pandemic. Um, so, as a way to support you, um, we'll post, of course, the link to the book in the chat. But is there an encouragement from the book that you would like to share with us to close the session today? Maybe. Hold on. <laughs> Let me see what I have here. Um, oh, man, there's so many. And here we <laughs> you probably now understand why the book is called You Never Know. Just you know, right. if you oh, well, listen closely. Yeah. And so, as you can see, it's, it's, uh, I made it into one word, advice from a mother. You never know. And I made it to one word, you never know. And I used it as my uh, mantra for everything I've done in my life. And um, so I was really happy with, you know, the way my life was going. I wanted to encourage other people. And I started out with a website, you never know website. And every Monday I would uh, write these blogs and to encourage people to, um, you know, go through the week, you know, with that, you never know state of mind. And I wrote so many blogs. I like, you know, this would be a great book people can take with them, like a friend, you know, they can take with them, you know, they can put it on the coffee table and put it in the bathroom, like by, right by their bed and read an encouragement, you know, and uh, there are 53 encouragements in there. And I promise you, whatever you're going through, something in there, it's going to get you through. It's going to help you help you get through it. So um, the one that comes to mind that I, just, I glanced at is that, um, you know, every day there's a person that we notice. We don't know the person's name. We don't know where they're from, but you know something about them, the way they dress, the way they carry themselves, um, the way their hair, something about them. But, you, you know, you see them every day as you go to work or you're doing your daily routine. And then what happens is that 
you start to look at them and then you give them, you know, your own uh, backstory. You know, uh, I see a man that's impeccably dressed, you know, here's a man that, you know, cares about himself. You know, he probably has a, 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 a lot of girlfriends and, uh, he, you know, he's a finance guy. I give I give this background. We all do it. We all do. It. We look at this one person. We have no idea what the person is, but we see them every day and we give him this this backstory. Here's the crazy thing. That's happening to you. Someone seeing you every day and giving the backstory. So you never know who's watching you. So I suggest put out your best self. Put out that person that you want people to see and then, and, 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 and to notice. So that's in the uh, encouragement in the book there to say, you know, get up in the morning knowing that someone's watching you, you know, and I don't mean to say in a creepy way, but someone could look at you, <laughs> look, looking at you as in, encouraging, looking at you and like saying, I like her style. I like the way he carries himself. Exactly. Exactly. Put on that jacket. So there's, there's someone there. So yeah. So just be mindful of that. Thank you. And, uh, you're amazing. You're funny. And I hope we get to the chance to host you again. Uh, you really brought light into, I hope all of our souls today, and we hope we can support you show up at Lincoln center, read your book. And you know, oh, you get on Amazon. it's on Amazon. It reached, uh, Amazon. it reached uh, number eight in the happiness category. And I'm very happy about that. Um, yeah, but if you never know, um, why apostrophe and oh, I'll put it in the chat. There we go. And who then, wouldn't uh, want to be number eight in the happiness category? I would, I would take, I would even take number nine any day. How, amazing. <laughs> um, thank you, Wally. Thanks for being here. Thanks for taking the time. You booked through February, so we'll check out your website and 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 stop by. Thank you, Wally, and uh, we can't wait to see you all again. This was Remote Daily for today. This is Remote Daily.